So exam paper 2017, semester one, we'll go through that on the morning of the 28th, nine o'clock. We'll, it'll probably take us up to two hours. Uh, if it doesn't, that's fine. We will also do, we'll have some time for just doing some extra questions afterwards. So you've got questions from other, I don't know, tutorials or uh, tests or other exams and stuff. Okay, any other comments on that? Anyone got anything to say? Any questions? Can we quickly do a recap of chapter 30 just to remind you that we have done chapter 30, then we will stop and we will finish chapter 31. So we're just going to take 10 minutes to do chapter 30 or maybe even 5, that'll be better. Just to recap. Chapter 30, we did fiscal policy. And the big thing about the fiscal policy of chapter 30, which we have not seen before, was the supply side effects. So we spoke about the national budget, what are the components of the national budget, how the national budget gets set and who's in charge of it. So our budget, we're going to have revenues and we're going to have expenditures. And then we can either have a surplus or a deficit or a balanced budget. And apart from looking at a bunch of figures and looking at where South Africa is going, and I don't know if you've been listening to the news, but there have been some really exciting political developments over the last week. The rumor at this point in time, although it has not yet been con confirmed, is that Dudu Mayeni is out of SAA. That's a good thing. Um, but have you seen that the new person in charge of the SABC is also a, a, a Zuma acolyte and has resigned from his position in some charity fund that basically Zuma runs. I mean, call it a charity fund. I don't know what it does. Um, so what was important then in our, in our financing stuff, I mean, our fiscal stuff again, this supply side effect of fiscal policy, this is important, okay? When we did some questions about this on Monday, when people ask some questions about fiscal policy, which was obviously not going to be in the test on Tuesday, but we did some of those questions anyway, there was a lot of confusion about the supply side effects. Okay, so please go back. We've, we've looked at it. Go back. Get on top of that stuff. A lot of people didn't seem very happy with it. Okay, so remember that there's this thing called the tax wedge and whether, we ta whether you impose a tax on income or whether you impose it on expenditure, it doesn't really matter. You get the same effects. Uh, and here we have the supply side effects in the loanable funds market as well. So when we have taxes, it affects the labor market and it's affecting the loanable funds market. Okay? It's there in the text. Have a read of it. If you have any questions... Come and talk to me about it. Spoke about the Laffer curve. Um, and then another co slightly complicated aspect of this chapter was the um, difference between automatic versus discretionary fiscal policy action. And we looked at these diagrams and I kind of tried to run through an explanation of what those diagrams were explaining. It's in the video. Watch that video if you're not happy with what the chapter says. Watch the video anyway. Whether you're happy or not. Um, I think the videos are all up to date at this point. I don't know if anyone's keeping up to date and watching those things at all. But I think they're up to date, right? So there'll be a new video today with chap I mean, of today's stuff, which is chapter 31. Okay, uh, so discretionary and fiscal policy, and then we just kind of put it all together in our ASAD model to show that we can use our ASAD model to basically ask interesting questions about what the government should or, or could be doing in our economy to make changes. Okay? So it's a nice tool, nice economic tool. And that was pretty much where we ended it, noting that fiscal policy, one of the problems with fiscal policy is it takes a long time. 
for any kind of fiscal policy action to result in a change. Three different lags, recognition lag, uh, lawmaking lag, as well as an impact lag. And that was the end of chapter 30. We had then moved on to chapter 31, and we had started it, but we hadn't got very far. Sorry, this is not the right one. Okay, this is the one we were looking at. So monetary policy, we said we're going to describe the objectives of South Africa's monetary policy framework, explain the monetary policy instruments that the Reserve Bank uses, explain the transmission channels through which the Reserve Bank influences GDP as well as inflation, illustrate and discuss the effects of monetary policy on interest rates, real GDP and prices, and show all of this stuff graphically. And basically we had done these first two bullet points, was where we left it, and we've got these last few ones to do today. So, we were running through the objectives of the Reserve Bank, it's to control inflation, and that's the mandate that's given to it through Parliament. And the Reserve Bank's goal is not to achieve 2% inflation per year, which is It's 3 to 6%. Sorry, my writing today is a little bit different because I left my other pad behind, and so now I've got to use this other one. Uh, what, what is it that we want to do? Why, what are the goals of inflation targeting? The goal is to make monetary policy clear in order to improve planning and decision making in both private and public sector. And we've, said, and we've seen that, in fact, that's really important because that's, that decision-making and the way that people uh, plan ahead is actually really important for explaining why our economy kind of goes up and down all the time, right? A lot of it is driven by people's expectations. So this is a really important part of monetary policy. Uh, it's part of a coordinated approach to reduce inflation in order to promote high and stable economic growth and empl employment. So the evidence suggests that when you have low inflation, it's good for growth. That's why we target inflation. The uh, goal is to focus monetary policy and to improve the accountability of the Reserve Bank. So this is all part of the communication strategy. Accountability is part of that. In other words, if the Reserve Bank says that it's trying to control inflation, it should be seen to be controlling inflation. So adjusting the interest rates in order to control inflation is a very visible way of doing that. Number four, it's the goal is to guide inflation expectations. You guide expectations, then you guide price and wage setting behavior. That's important. So what are our instruments? We know that there's the repo rate, and with the repo rate comes the reserve requirements as well as open market operations. What happens ultimately? We adjust the either the reserve requirement or the repo rate or anything else, and it's all about shifting liquidity requirements. And it's the banks that provide liquidity, so when we adjust these things, we adjust the liquidity that banks provide and uh, that's one of the channels through which it operates. So we ended on this slide. We were talking about the market for reserves and for some reason the, the textbook has the reserves as a vertical curve and then well, vertical line and then the repo rate for example as a horizontal line. I don't know why they got two lines there. It, it basically it's a horizontal line. I don't know why you need a vertical line. But whatever the repo rate is, the story go that they tell and the story that's true and the story or well, the reason why they stick this vertical curve in there, it seems, is to say whatever the repo rate is that the Reserve Bank sets, there will be some quantity of reserves that are demanded at that repo rate. And whatever that quantity demanded is, that is what the quantity will be supplied by the Reserve Bank. Which is the same as just having a horizontal reserve supply curve. So We don't need a vertical one, but that's how they've done it. 
So what happens when the Reserve Bank changes the repo rate? It basically just increases, it can either raise it or it can lower it. Whether it shifts it up or it shifts it down, it then makes more or less reserves available. Okay, so if it wants to raise the repo rate, raises the repo rate, okay, then the equilibrium quantity in the market will be lower. All it does is it just reduces the amount of reserves available. Okay. So the point here is, in fact, that if the demand curve would shift, right, the Reserve Bank doesn't just let the repo rate go up. It would accommodate that by increasing the quantity of reserves. So it's basically like it's just a horizontal curve, which is why I say all the information is contained in that horizontal curve. There's nothing really added by adding a vertical curve, but that's how they've done it. So that's what they've done. Okay. So what happens after we've got the Reserve Bank changing the repo rate and making more or less reserves available to commercial banks? This then influences, sorry, changing the reserve ratio is part of its um, strategy to influence the inflation rate or the output gap. Okay. So remember the Reserve Bank's forecast of the inflation rate are a crucial ingredients in the interest rate decision. Effects raising and lowering of the repo rate. Okay. So if the inflation rate is high, then the Reserve Bank will raise the repo rate. If the inflation rate is low, then there's no need to raise the repo rate. And if we're in a recession, in other words, if the output gap is negative, if we have a recessionary gap, so the output gap is negative, then there's room for the Reserve Bank to lower the interest rate. Of course, if we have a high, if we have an inflationary gap, so the output gap is positive, if we have a high output gap, so it's positive, then the Reserve Bank might want to raise interest rates even if it hasn't yet resulted in inflation, if it expects the inflation to increase. So if the Reserve Bank says we have a, a positive output gap and we expect that to lead to inflation in the future, the Reserve Bank will communicate that, will release statements to say, the inflation rate at this point in time is not a problem, but we, see, we think that the, there is a positive output gap that will lead to inflation within the next few months. Therefore, we are raising the interest rate. Or therefore, we think we will raise the interest rate soon in the future. There's no inflation now, but we expect it to come. And if we see it coming, we are raising that interest rate, right? Manages people's expectations. Then people can say, okay, well, we expect this is what the Reserve Bank is going to do. Okay? So this was the diagram from um, the previous chapter where we saw an inflationary gap. Okay? In other words, you're above full employment. You expect inflation. Alternatively, we can have a recessionary gap where we are below full employment. We expect uh, either inflation to, to fall or to have deflation. And of course, this inflationary gap is associated with, in our business cycle, when we're above potential, we're in a sort of a peak in our, or heading towards a peak in our business cycle, whereas the recessionary gap is as we are entering into recession, but heading down um, to below full employment and heading towards what we'd call a, a trough. And so there are actually three transmission channels here, which is interesting. When the Reserve Bank changes the repo rate, what happens? There are three transmission channels. First of all, the bank lending rate. Secondly, interest rates in other markets like the loanable funds market. 
bond markets. And then thirdly, the exchange rates, and we haven't yet dealt with the exchange rate. That's chapter 26. We'll do that tomorrow. But obviously, when the Reserve Bank changes the repo rate, that changes the interest rate that banks charge on their loans and also as, uh, what they pay on deposits. Which, in, when the bank changes their rates, that changes consumption and investment decisions. Of course, any change in interest rates in bank lending rates also leads to change in interest rates in loanable funds markets. So any other borrowing that happens in the economy is also affected, which also affects consumption and investment, and as well as government spending, in fact, because, I mean, remember that government also borrows through loanable funds markets. So it can also affect uh, government spending. And then the exchange rate influences imports and exports, and all of these, consumption and investment, imports and exports, affects expenditure, which f affects... not the supply side, right? Okay. So the rest of these slides basically just talk about the, those transmission channels. The bank credit transmission channel. As soon as the MPC announces a new setting for the repo rate, the cost of funds for banks changes and therefore banks adjust their lending rates. What about the interest rate transmission channel? Well, the monetary policy decision taken by the MPC represents a change in the repo rate and since the repo rate changes, it affects the interest rates in the economy as well. What kind of interest rates? Well, we have a short-term treasury interest rate as well as long-term bond rates. And I'm actually working on something with that now, so I can show you. Here we go. That was easy. Um, if you look at... Oops. So this dark blue line is the repo rate. So here it kind of, you can see it jumping down there. Doop, doop, doop. And then you can see, sorry, you can see the rates on other instruments. So you've got a three-month treasury bill. Is this pink line, and you can see it basically sits on whatever the repo rate is. That's the interest rate charged, except back here. That's the interest rate that you that you earn or charge that on um, three-month treasury bills. So any government debt will pay that interest rate, or will get traded to pay that interest rate. Uh, and then if you look at, say, a three-month notice deposit at a bank to corporates, you can see it also basically, it's this green line. It just follows pretty much exactly whatever the repo rate is. You can see the bank rates and government rates track that repo rate almost identically. These are the three months, so those are pretty short term. When you look at a longer term fixed deposit, the purple um, line here, which is one year, you can see it sort of moves... A little bit less than the dark blue line, but it kind of it still follows it, just doesn't follow it as exactly. And then you get a government bond, which is a three-year government bond, and you can see this kind of, you know, it, it follows the dark blue line, but it's also a little bit on its own there. Right? That's much longer term. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I was meant to after chapter thirty. Absolutely. Ten minutes, and then we'll uh, carry on.